few years ago, I was flying in a helicopter over a rainforest between two mountain ranges in Madagascar. Pastor Brian was with me on that trip. And because of a storm, we couldn't see enough to climb out of the valley, and so we were stuck between the two mountain ranges. At one point, we thought we were going to have to land on a river bank to conserve fuel. It was a little scary, but it was incredibly beautiful. When after the storm and the rain finally finished, we were able to climb out of the rainforest and looked out the window of the helicopter to see a beautiful rainbow over the rainforest. When you see a rainbow, what comes to mind? Some of you think a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, which, by the way, I, if you ever find that, the tithe on a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow is 90%. Uh, some of you think of my favorite cereal, Lucky Charms. Anybody else Lucky Charms fan? All right, a few of you. Maybe you think of a leprechaun. But for a lot of people, what comes to mind is a song first made famous in a movie I've never seen, The Wizard of Oz. It's a beautiful song. But does a rainbow really mean that skies are blue and every dream comes true? Actually, a rainbow means much more than that. A rainbow lets you know something happened, that there was a storm. If you see the rainbow, you survive the storm. And what comes next can actually be a difficult transition. During a storm, you're defensive in, in nature. During a storm, you do whatever it takes to survive, to make it through. In a financial goal, your storm is to survive to come out on the other side. If your marriage is in a storm, you just want your marriage to survive. If there's a storm at your job, you're trying to stay employed. If in a relationship storm, you're just desperately trying to save the relationship. When you're in a storm of sickness or disease, you're trying to make it through. You're trying to survive. When you're in a storm, survival instinct takes over. That's human nature. However, on the other side of the storm, the adrenaline's gone. Survival mode doesn't work anymore. So what should be your response when the storm has gone and the rain is done? With God's help, Noah weathered the ultimate storm. The earth and every living creature was destroyed by a flood, but because Noah obeyed God, he and his family were saved. And today we look at Noah's response to God's deliverance and learn what to do after the rain. We pick it up in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 13. By the end of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah and his family were in the ark over a year. They had to be anxious to leave that boat. If I had been on that ark, I couldn't do it. At some point, I would have just dove off and gone swimming just to take a break from the family and from the animals. Noah removed the covering from the ark and saw the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you, your wife, your sons, and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that's with you. The birds, the animals, all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth, be fruitful, and increase in number. So Noah came out together with his sons and wives and his sons' wives, all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on the earth, came out of the ark, one kind after another. Now, if you read that quick, you might not have caught it. On the first day of the first month, they saw that the surface was dry. They had to wait another 50 days until it was completely dry. That seems a little unreasonable. It's a long time. Let me ask you, would God have to tell you, okay, now you can leave? Not me. At the first moment I saw dry land, I would be running from those animals. Not Noah. Noah waited for a word from God. It was God who told him to go in the ark. Noah wasn't leaving until God said go, even though the earth looked dry. During the storm, you understand the importance of obeying God. You have to if you want to make it through the storm. But after the rain, when the storm is over, don't let your guard down. Keep obeying God. 
Maybe the best way I know how to illustrate this is with your prayer life. When people are attacking you and the pressure's on, when, you're, when your health is failing, you pray like crazy. You don't have any trouble remembering your quiet time, your prayer time when you're trying to survive. I've noticed that in my own life. When people are coming against me, when people are saying cruel things, I have no problem finding time to pray. And then when the storm passes, you get busy again. You don't have, time, you don't have to pray to survive, so you think. And you start missing your prayer time. It's just not as big a priority. After all, your finances are ordered, your kids are doing well, no one's coming against you, and the crisis is over. How foolish we must appear to God. And how sad. We're faithful and obedient when the pressure's on. But when the pressure is off, we go right back to our old patterns. God must get tired of watching it. Don't do that. When the storm passes, keep obeying God. God told Noah and his family to come out of the ark. After one year, Noah and his family were back on dry ground. And I tried to imagine what must have come next. Noah stepped off the ark, leaned down, kissed the ground. Or Noah threw his arms in the air and proclaimed one small step for Noah, one giant step for mankind. Maybe Noah took a long hot shower or went for a long walk by himself without any of the animals and absolutely without his family. Maybe when they got off, Noah's wife said, now will you build me the house I've been wanting? I think Noah took a vow to never have a pet again. Maybe he turned and set the ark on fire. You can imagine Noah turning to his children and saying, the answer to are we there yet is yes. Or Noah took off his Dramamine patch. Noah said, no more family vacations. Noah killed both skunks and said, there will never be a skunk on this earth again. See, we'd, we'd understand any of those reactions. Noah endured and survived the longest storm imaginable. But Noah didn't build a statue to himself, write a book, or hit the lecture circuit to teach on boat building and storm surviving. Noah didn't turn to his family and say, I told you so. Instead, Noah modeled the correct response when you come through a storm. When the storm is finally over, follow his example. Verse 20, then Noah built an altar to the Lord, taking some of the clean animals and clean birds. He sacrificed burnt offerings on it. Noah's response wasn't anger or resentment or even relief. Noah knew surviving the storm had nothing to do with his boat-building ability. It was only possible because of the strength and the faithfulness of his God. And so Noah didn't talk about the storm. Have you ever seen someone do that? They talk about the storm instead of focusing on the God who brought them through. If you ever come here at testimony night at Celebrate Recovery, when they share their testimony... They spend a little bit of time on the storm, and they spend a whole lot of time on the faithfulness of God who brought them through the storm. You want to do that. You, you, don't want to, you don't want to make the emphasis the storm. You want to make the emphasis the Lord. Noah wasn't bitter over the length of the storm. He didn't shake his fist and say, God, how could you do that to me? Noah wasn't proud because he survived the storm. Look at me. Noah didn't rant and rave about the unfair nature of the storm. God, how could you let me go through that bad a storm for that long? If you really loved me, that wouldn't have happened. Noah didn't question the reason for the storm. Noah didn't say, God, why did that happen to me? God, why did you allow that? What did I do to deserve that? Noah didn't get out of the boat, build a throne, and declare himself king of the world based on being head of the only family on earth that made it through. Instead... Noah walked out of the ark, he built an altar, and he worshipped the God who brought him through the storm. Noah's worship is a beautiful response, beautiful picture of what you should do when the storm is over and the rain is gone. Worship. Worship the God who watches over, who protects you and provides for you and delivers you from the storm. Sometimes we're tempted to give glory to ourselves. 
It's so easy to rely on God during the storm, but brag on yourself after the storm. Worship acknowledges, God, I never would have made it through the storm without you. You're the reason that I survived. It wasn't my strength. It wasn't my ability. It wasn't my smarts or my talent or my strategy. God, the only reason I made it through the storm was you. And I worship you for bringing me through. Worship gives God the glory. Maybe you've watched someone and not understood their worship. And you look and say, why are they so loud? Why are they so excited? Why do they have to shout or dance? Why do they clap and why are they so loud? What's all that about? You don't understand their worship because you weren't with them in their storm. When the storm stops and you come through on the other side, your worship is extravagant. It's filled with thankfulness and joy. If you were in the 1130 service last weekend, you saw someone at the altar at the end, extremely emotional. You might even have questioned her response. You might have watched and say, well, she's just overly dramatic. You would have said that because you don't know her story. So let me read you her Facebook post after church. She wrote, when we arrived at church this morning, I was holding back tears of pain. But I went to church because I longed to be in his house of worship among my brothers and sisters in Christ, something I hadn't been able to do since February. The title of the sermon was Surviving the Storm. Coincidence? After the sermon, Pastor Rod made an invitation to the altar to everyone who wanted to pray. With difficulty, in pain, and using a cane, I walked to the altar and stood there. In my mind, I was telling God I couldn't remember my life without the storm. I couldn't remember the last time in my life of the sun coming out. But I also prayed if he was using these storms to position me where he wanted for his glory, I was fine with that. Then as a sister in Christ was praying for me, my pain went from a nine to a two in a matter of seconds. I honestly can't remember the last time it's been this good, but I can assure you it's been years. Now listen to the next part. This explains what you thought was an overly emotional reaction. I fell on my knees, which I haven't been able to do in years due to advanced severe arthritis in both of them. And all I could do was worship. It wasn't just the physical pain, but the emotional pain of dealing with chronic illnesses for so long and bottling it in, keeping it from mostly everyone. It was gone in seconds, and in its place was joy, all caps, yes, joy. I was now crying tears of joy. Why do I share this? Because he did it. Not that I deserve it because I'm not worthy of any of his mercies for me. He did it because it pleased him. I share because you might also be in the middle of a storm. Maybe like me, you've forgotten what life looks like without these hurricane winds, but God has not forgotten you. He has not abandoned you. Now, do you understand our worship? It's a sad thing when you're so far removed from the storm that you forget what God's done for you. Grateful storm survivors are passionate worshipers. I don't know what song Noah sang, but maybe it was something like this. Stains, and now I'm living day to 
today by his grace so excuse me if i can't contain my praise because i know that i Look at God's reaction to Noah's worship. Verse 21, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. Noah's worship was pleasing to God. Your worship is pleasing to God. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, and he said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. That's you. That's me. Never again will I destroy all living creatures as I've done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Noah's worship is what led God to make the covenant. Like Noah, you have a deeper relationship with God because you learn to trust him and rely on him through the storm. And then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, be fruitful Increase in number and fill the earth. The earth and dread of you will fall, fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth, all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground, upon all the fish of the sea. They're given into your hands. 
Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. After the storm, Noah worshiped God and gave him glory. And in response, God said, Noah, I'm going to bless you. You you will rule over the animals, the birds, fish. They exist for you. Be blessed. During the storm, the blessings of God often seem absent. They're still there. It's just harder to focus on the blessings because you're focused on survival. But after the storm, celebrate God's blessings. God is so good. And you say, come on, Rod, what blessing do I have to celebrate? Well, if you can't find one, I'll give you a few. Celebrate the fact that you survived the storm. So thank God for his love. Thank him for saving you and forgiving you. Thank God for your church family. Thank God for what you learned during the storm. You discovered his faithfulness, his protection, and how much you need him. Thank God for the storm surviving testimony he gave you. If that's not enough, thank God that the sun came up this morning and that you were alive to see it. After the storm, celebrate the blessings of God. And then God said to Noah and his sons, I now establish my covenant with you. And with your descendants, with every living creature that was with you, I established my covenant. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. I've set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it. Remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on earth. God said to Noah, this is a sign of the covenant I've established between me and all life on earth. Because Noah was faithful and obeyed God, God made a covenant that there would never be an earth-destroying flood. God saw Noah's faithfulness, and Noah's faithfulness and obedience changed the world. When you're faithful and obedient through the storm, you discover the faithfulness of God. And like Noah, God will use you to change the world. After the rain and after the storm, God made a world-changing promise. God set a rainbow in the sky and said, this rainbow rainbow will forever be the sign of my covenant with you and with all people. And from that day on, every time Noah and his family saw a rainbow, they remembered the promise and they remembered God who brought them through the storm. When you see a rainbow in the sky, Don't think about a pot of gold, a bowl of lucky charms, or the beautiful song Lindsay sang. Instead, every rainbow is a reminder that you survived the storm. Every rainbow is the reminder of the difference one person obedient to God can make. Every rainbow is a reminder that you serve a covenant-making, promise-keeping, always watching out for you, God. After the rain... Look for the rainbow, the reminder of God's promises. After the rain, remember God's promises. It's a great story. Because of the obedience of Noah, there will never again be an earth-destroying flood. Now let me show you one more thing before we go. This story is a type. A type is something in the Old Testament that points to something in the New Testament. Hundreds of years later, after that flood, once again, the world was evil. Once again, man through sin had broken relationship with God. Once again, people deserved death for their sins. But God remembered his promise. And destroying them was not an option. And this time, instead of sending a storm, God sent a savior, his son. And once again, Because of evil, someone had to pay the price. Jesus hung on the cross, and he paid the price for me and for you. Because of Jesus' obedience, 
God set in place a new covenant by which all people could avoid destruction. Jesus' obedience became our covenant. God made a covenant that whoever put their faith and trust in Jesus and his death on the cross as payment for their sins would experience salvation and eternal life. We have a covenant. We have a promise of eternal life because of Jesus. The cross is a reminder of Jesus' sacrifice. So here's my challenge to you. When you see a rainbow, remember the cross. God's promise to save us, you and me, from destruction. We serve a promise-keeping God. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to pray for you. And this is, this is not the direction I thought I was going at the end, but I just felt the Lord prompt me to do this. I'm going to be obedient to him. If you feel like you have a promise from God, but you're just not seeing it happen, I want to pray for you. I, I understand this is not a trick. I, I'm not... I'm not condemning you. I'm not going to trick you and then say you should just believe. But if you feel like I, I've, I've got a promise, I'm standing on that promise, I'm believing for that promise, but I'm not seeing something happen. And I just need to be reminded that he keeps his promises. I need, I need to be reminded of that because I've, I've got to stay faithful through this. I mean, this, this could be one person. But God just designed this moment just for you, and I want to pray for you. And if that's you and you say, I'm, I'm struggling, I've got a promise, but no action, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. Would you do one more thing for me? If you raise your hand, would you stand up? We're going to pray. Again, I promise no tricks. It's not a trick. Would you just stand right where you're at? And we're going to pray. Just before we pray, I want to encourage you. He is a promise-keeping God. And I'm sure there were moments on that ark for all that time where Noah wondered about God's promise and wondered if God was ever going to see them through the storm, ever going to deliver them. But one day, one day the sun broke through the clouds and where the rain and storm was, a rainbow appeared. And it was God's, God's reminder of God's promise. He's a covenant-keeping God.